So actually, with that said, we're going to call up our first speaker, Dr. Adam Kaplan. Great. So thank you all for coming out here. Obviously, we know it's a big commitment to get up and get going and come here. I did want to start off by giving a special thanks um, you know, to uh, Carlos, Michael, and Maureen, um, and let you know that it, these guys work incredibly hard. And um, yet, at the same time, I can tell you it really is like a family. And they not only work really hard, but they also really make it a, a great atmosphere to work. I hope you guys feel a part of this sort of uh, extended family. And I will tell you that we had to actually, just so you know, um, uh, kidnap Maureen because she was still here at 9 o'clock last night preparing for the symposium. So a group of us had to kidnap her and get her to go out and have some dinner. So she really worked incredibly hard to make this possible. Um, and, uh, and I also want to, just so I don't forget, uh, thank Daniel Becker, who's been a remarkable um, collaborator. And I'm going to tell three stories here. The third story is one that um, he should be here beside me to tell because it's one we uh, did together with um, this person you probably don't know, Cody Unser. She's, anyway, she's, oh, wait, uh, there, there's Cody in back hiding. So Cody could also um, uh, be up here uh, as well for that part. Okay, so with that in mind, um, I am a psychiatrist, and I guess the question is, what's a psychiatrist doing in a place like this? It reminds me of the joke, um, how many uh, psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Answer is just one, but the light bulb has to want to change. So, <laughs> so um, it has been a privilege to work um, as a member of the Transverse Myelitis Center. Um, I'm just, you know, this is just going to go rather quickly to get through three stories in the time I have so that Janet doesn't start sort of getting the hook and pulling me off stage. But so transverse means across, uh, meaning affecting both sides of the spinal cord. Myelitis means inflammation of the spinal cord. And as you guys know, I don't you know, have to tell you guys this, but it, you know, this is the, the, the spinal cord is basically all of the, the cables that convey all the information that comes out of the brain going to the body, uh, and depending on where you get the lesion in the spinal cord, you get everything below it. So, you know, you can see that this says here, it's actually quite small there. Uh, you know, so you get legs here, sexual function, um, uh, hand, fingers, and as you go up all the way up to breathing, and wherever you get the lesion, it can potentially affect everything below that. Now, having said that, TM is a tenth as common, as far as we know, as multiple sclerosis, so most of the work that's been done um, has looked at multiple sclerosis. So I, I just want to use multiple sclerosis as sort of the kissing cousin of TM, about which we know more, although because of the work being done uh, in the TM center, uh, things are definitely catching up. But in any case, like with MS, uh, TM is presumably a combination of a certain predisposition that people have uh, to have perhaps a, an aggressive immune system combined with uh, something that fools the immune system and leads to dysregulation and ultimately combined with some environmental thing. So you can imagine the combination, just as an example, of somebody who um, has a viral infection that is sort of hiding, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and it's mimicking the looking like the myelin, which is the, you know, uh, wrapping around the neurons. Um, and then the, the immune system gets flipped into attacking that virus, but now it also will attack the myelin. And then something happens that leads to a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Could be as simple as, you know, a whiplash or something like that. And then you could imagine you'd be off to the races once the immune system got uh, going. So that's just sort of a quick overview. And um, it's important to know that um, that one of the stories I'm going to tell is that traditionally TM has been thought to be a strictly below the neck kind of thing, and I'm an above the neck kind of guy. So what I'm going to try to explain is how we have more and more evidence to say that the brain is actually involved too. Um, you know, the diagnostic criteria for TM includes seeing when you actually put uh, a needle down here in your lumbar region, seeing that there are white blood cells, even if the lesion's really high up here, you can see the blood cells down here because 
the cerebrospinal fluid is bathing the brain and spinal cord, so it's not so crazy to imagine that because the spinal fluid is full of these cells that there might be brain involvement. But when we first started this, um, that wasn't known. I like to um, just talk briefly about uh, this study. This was a study that was out of San Francisco, and they just phoned up people with multiple sclerosis 10 years after the diagnosis. And they said, how has the MS affected your life? And the interesting thing about it is that um, although it's true, one in five people gave responses to say that it had created a strain in their relationship, you know, depending on, you know, other people or um, working together as a family unit in adversity, life under altered circumstances can be very trying. 30% uh, of people said that they were demoralized. But what was really most interesting about this study, I think, is that 60% of people gave responses that really the researchers had to lump into this category, they said benefit finding, which means that these people, 10 years out from the diagnosis, were saying that in some way, shape, or form, the diagnosis of this neurological, autoimmune neurological disease had actually benefited them in some way. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking California, this is before medical marijuana. So let me just show you uh, what kinds of things that they said. Uh, my friends and family have become more helpful. I'm closer to my family. I mean, the opportunity to see individuals um, who now, uh, you know, men who now had to stay home perhaps more than they used to, taking care of their family, getting to know their kids in a new way. Um, you know, uh, people who sort of reset their priorities, learn to be more compassionate, respectful of others, appreciate the independence and the like. And so I just think it, the important thing is not to say that you should feel great about being touched in some way, shape, or form by this uh, transverse myelitis. This, uh, uh, no one would wish, you know, any of these diseases on anybody. But it's not inevitable that it should alter one's course and one's life and one's goals necessarily um, in a limiting way. Um, so I just like to point that out because when we're going to get in just a moment to the issue of depression, um, it's not inevitable. And in fact, if there is depression, it's sort of uh, there's smoke there and there's a fire going on that can be put out. So just to sort of give you a quick overview. This just shows us that, unfortunately, and uh, mea culpa, this is a problem with psychiatry specifically, but our society in general, that not only have we not been winning the battle against depression, but this shows that over the past decade, there's been a 30% increase in the suicide rate in this country. We've now reached epidemic proportions. So if you don't know about this, because it has been in the news, you should know that as a society, the rates of suicide are astronomically high in the military. More people by far are dying at their own hands than from any active combat anywhere in the world. Um, and then the other thing that you should know is that last year there were more suicides, deaths from suicides, than there were from automobile accidents. So this is really a time that we really need to sound the alarm and say this is something we can't just stop saying, well, it's, you know, you'd be depressed too or it's not my problem, it's someone else's problem. This affects all of us. And this just shows also after the downturn in the stock market, things got even worse. And I'm just driving this home last slide along the... Oops. But um, what this shows is that from after 2007, you saw that increase. What has happened is that it's become the third leading... Suicide's the third leading cause of death for our kids. 10 to 24, it's the second leading cause of death for young adults, and that has pushed suicide into the top 10 list, not something that we wanted to be in the top 10 list. So this is something that needs to be addressed more globally, and I will tell you that the work we're doing, looking in transverse myelitis, um, as well as neuromyelitis optica, Michael Levy is doing very exciting work looking at NMO, at the effects on the brain and concentration, cognition, and depression. These are things that hopefully will translate into a better understanding of these illnesses for the general population. So what is depression? What is clinical depression? The, the most important thing to know is it's not normal sadness. And so what I teach the medical students is um, depression is a syndrome. It's not just sadness. Sadness is the depression what cough is to pneumonia. 
meaning that during the course of this presentation, someone will cough, and it's not because they've got pneumonia, it's because they're drinking a sip of water, because it's dry air, maybe they've got asthma. There are many reasons that people cough. So cough can be an indicator of pneumonia, but not every cough is the result of it. Sometimes pneumonia presents even without a cough. In the young, and particularly the very old, you can get pneumonia without a cough. And in the young and the old, you get depression without sadness. Normally you see irritability as sort of the equivalent symptom. And you say, Johnny, are you sad? And he says, no, and he kicks the chair and he storms up and slams his door, right? And so what you really need to do is consider the company that the cough keeps. If it's a productive cough um, with rapid breathing and a temperature and you look at the x-ray and there's this fuzzy region, you call that um, pneumonia. So it's really a symptom cluster. This is the symptom cluster for, um, for depression. And we remember it as SIGIM caps. That actually means more to a doctor because SIG is what we write on our prescriptions for how to um, prescribe and caps as caplets. But anyway, the important thing to know is that you need to have five of nine of these symptoms, at least one of which is decreased interest or decreased mood. And it's basically that you have trouble sleeping, either increased sleeping or early morning awakenings. Your get up and go has gotten up and gone. Things that used to give you pleasure no longer do. Feelings of guilt or worthlessness. People's self-esteem hits rock bottom. Energy and fatigue uh, is, is very common. Mood, and remember, that's the sadness, but it's only one of nine symptoms, and you don't need it to make the diagnosis. Concentration problems, appetite changes. Normally, it's either people, food doesn't taste right and people stop eating, or they start comfort eating and crave carbohydrates. For men, it's often salty foods. Women, it's chocolate, although that obviously has a big crossover. <laughs> Dr. Sadowski is going, oh no, she eats a lot of chocolate and she's, you're not depressed, I promise you. So, and then what's called psychomotor retardation, which means you're not your normal bubbly self. And then thoughts of death or dying or wanting to call it quits. This is the equivalent of chest pain to psychiatry, okay? This is an emergency. Um, if you or your loved ones are having those symptoms, that needs to be addressed. Just like if someone was saying they had chest pain, that needs to be addressed because that is life-threatening. So you, all you need is to have five of nine or more of those symptoms for greater than two weeks. You bought yourself the diagnosis of depression. Um, the more symptoms you have, the more likely you are to respond to treatment. Now, the important thing to know is that um, uh, MS has been generally considered to be the Michael Phelps of depression, meaning that it's associated with 50% of people following the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, not prior to, but following it, will get the diagnosis of a clinical depression. Not just, gee, you'd be depressed too, or, you know, it's that symptom cluster of all of those things. And you can see, though, that many different things cause depression, particularly anything that affects the brain, since that's where the regulator is for our moods. There is a mood regulator in your brain that um, essentially, like the thermostat in the room, if it gets stuck, it'll get quite hot here uh, or cold, depending on where it gets stuck. And there is a mood regulator in your brain. If you don't believe me, ask anybody who's ever done cocaine. Uh, that's what stimulates that mood regulator. Cocaine has no withdrawal symptoms, just people crave it like crazy because it gets to that mood regulator. And uh, hypothyroidism, B12 deficiency, many things that affect the brain can cause depression. But MS is the number one, traditionally thought of as the number one, though now we've shown that the rates of depression and TM are roughly equivalent. We can't tell the difference because it's so common. Um, so it could be more, could be slightly less, but it's in the ballpark. So again, compared to the general population, at any given time, one in four patients with MS is depressed. That's five times the general population. There's also cognitive impairment in MS, about 50%, and we'll get back to that later. But as you can see, it's very common. It's not a matter of personal weakness, however. But here's the problem if you miss it. So if someone's having trouble with, if they're depressed and have these symptoms and they're having trouble with sleep, they often get put on sedatives like Valium or uh, Ativan or these kinds of things. The problem with those medicines is they're sort of alcohol in a pill and they affect concentration. So it often gets written off as, oh, memory loss, uh, but that makes memory worse. And the other problem is that also worsens fatigue. So people get put on stimulants uh, as a result of the fatigue and the higher the stimulants, the harder the people have a hard time sleeping. So now you gotta increase the sedatives and you can see how you get into trouble treating it symptom by symptom as opposed to getting the underlying cause. And the other thing is that, you know, if you have um, a little bit of pain, 
it's bad. If you have depression and a little bit of pain, it's really bad. So it basically magnifies the suffering of anything, including pain. So a lot of times people take marijuana for the pain, and again, that's going to impair their concentration, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so if you miss the diagnosis and you start treating it symptom by symptom, by symptom you'll actually end up doing more harm than good um, most of the time. So again, I'm going to just summarize a lot of the literature and tell you that we now know, and there's uh, extensive evidence to say that MS depression is caused not because of people not being strong enough or weak. It's nothing like that. In fact, what I always worry about are the people who are the strongest hide their depression and can go along functioning just fine, but actually their depression is getting worse and worse and worse until it finally grabs them by the collar because now they're not getting up, they're not going to work, or they're having panic attacks or something that brings them to a so we know that it's really periods of inflammation that make the difference. That's when people get depressed, when that happens. And it's important to say that um, depression is important for a number of reasons. Among them, it's the primary determining factor in someone's quality of life. It's more important than if you have cognitive impairment. It's more important than if you're in a wheelchair or not. It is the number one correlate. And I can prove that to you just by showing you in a minute that it is. Uh, has a very high rate of suicide associated with it. And obviously, if you're willing to kill yourself, you're going to give up everything else um, because this is the number one issue that you're dealing with. Um, it's also the number one uh, quality of life for the caregiver. So if not for you, if you won't get yourself treated for yourself, do it for your loved ones because that's also going to have a big effect. I don't have time to get into this in any detail, but if there's one message to get out to the caregivers in the room, the people who, are, who's tied, who have tied their wagons to the people who, whose bodies have TM, it's just to let you know that when you're riding in an airplane and the oxygen mask drop down, who do you put it on first, yourself or your loved one? Right. And for those of you who hesitated, just so you know, you got about 30 seconds before the air is sucked out of the airplane. Uh, and if you're struggling with your loved ones, your kids, for instance, and they're screaming and you're screaming and to get them to get on that, then they're going to pass out. You're going to pass out. No one's going to make it. If, on the other hand, you put your oxygen mask on first, you can struggle with them if that's what you want. Or you can just sort of count to 30 and then they'll be <laughs> resting comfortably right beside you to put the mask. On. Just depends on, but the important thing is to let you know it's very important that you make sure that you're getting enough oxygen. So that means, yes, of course, you have to go out with friends. Yes, of course, you have to go out to the movies. Don't feel guilty if you leave your loved one at home to recharge your engines. You're doing that for your loved one. So, um, and uh, so again, and this is just to drive home the point 30% of people with MS will have. Uh, suicidal ideation, 10% of people with MS will actually attempt suicide. So it's a big problem. Um, this is the good news. Of course, your daddy loves you. He's on Prozac. He loves everybody. So it didn't have to be the case that the kind of depression that comes from the immune system getting activated would respond to the same medicines that we use for depression um, in the general population from genetic reasons or the like. But it turns out they do. And that's really good news because that means um, treatment is possible. Now, the other part of the treatment that's important to know is if you take blood from patients who have multiple sclerosis um, and you measure how aggressive and angry those white blood cells are, the immune system is, when you activate it. In people who are depressed, it's twice as aggressive. You treat their depression and the depression comes down to normal, uh, sorry, the activation of the immune system comes down to normal level. And that led these, uh, this important study that was published uh, actually a while ago to say the treatment of depression may provide novel disease modifying therapeutic strategy as well as symptomatic treatment. What they mean by disease modifying is it treating the depression is actually treating the MS itself. And we have further evidence for that. This is a study that came out. White bars show what happens when you put people who are not depressed with uh, multiple sclerosis on um, on fluoxetine, an SSRI, uh, Prozac, compared to uh, those who get put on a placebo, this is increasing number of lesions over the course of 24 weeks in the people who were put on placebo. And if they were put on an SSRI, they didn't have activation. And this was statistically significant for those of you who really like statistics. This was a statistically significant finding. And just to give an idea of the number of patients with new enhancing lesions was 
in the group, um, sorry, the number of people with no enhancing lesions that didn't increase was 63%, and that was more than twice as many as the 23% of placebo who did not have enhancing lesions. So it made a really big difference to be on the treatment. So basically, we know now that there's this sort of complicated triad, um, which is depression, uh, MS causes depression, depression worsens the MS, and inflammation seems to be involved in both. That when you're depressed, you have higher inflammation, which also worsens the MS. And you can go round and round and round here if you don't um, make an intervention. So again, why did I tell you all this here at the Transverse Myelitis Symposium? Well, it's because this is, shows you what the suicide rate was from the first 500 patients seen in the Transverse Myelitis Center. We're a long way from that, but at that time we were tracking to see what was going on. And there's huge error bars on this, but out of the first 500, five individuals had committed suicide, most of them while waiting to get into the TM Center. But you know, we hear about this now on Facebook, on the TM website all the time. There was someone um, in South America who just committed suicide recently with transverse myelitis. And, you know, there's huge error bars, but we know this is TM, this is the rate of suicide in MS, this is the rate of suicide in general depression, and we know that TM is at least as high, and we know the depression rates are at least, you know, equivalent to, to, to MS. So it's important, but the good news is that there's every reason to believe that with treatment, it, first of all, you could be put back to your old self in terms of those symptoms, the SIGEM CAP symptoms. Very hard to you know, get many of the symptoms better, which is why there's a symposium, uh, but multiple, uh, sorry, depression is one of the set of symptoms that really can be completely treated back to your old level of mood, energy, et cetera, that's being caused by the depression. So let me just switch gears and tell you that it used to be considered 30 years ago that only 3% of patients with MS had any memory problems. You know, I know none of you have ever experienced this, but we're talking about like going into the next room and wondering what you came in there for. And when you used to be able to just, you know, have everything in your memory to just go to the phone and dial it now, reading what the phone number is and remembering by the time you get to the phone what all those digits are, those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. Usually we're not talking about, you know, really dramatic, can't remember, uh, you know, um, where you live, those kinds of things. We're talking about more mild to moderate uh, kinds of memory problems. It used to be thought 3% of patients with MS. We now know it's just that we did, weren't looking. So we now know that it's closer to 50%. And again, most of the people it's, who have it, of that 50%, it's mild to moderate. So what we did was, um, and this was work done with Kristen Ron, uh, when we went to, uh, uh, CC camp, camp for courageous kids. And we just basically brought a tablet and she ran around and she had kids, kids like that adorable child right there. Um, Mackenzie uh, did this. So where they just had this uh, asterisk pop up and every time it popped up, they had to hit the screen. And then we got data back and compared that from the kids with TM to their, um, to their siblings. And there was a highly statistical difference between in this case, controls are their siblings, where the response rates were much higher, the number of responses per minute, than those kids with transverse myelitis. And if you look at the reaction time, how long it took them to, to, to respond to the correct responses, there was statistically significant, highly significant um, differences in, in the kids with TM. Now, it doesn't mean that they couldn't do it. It just meant that they needed more time more practicing. And so the important thing to know is that people with TM, the 50% of people who do have an effect, really just need to know that it just means that now it's great if you used to keep everybody's phone numbers in your head. Now you have to do, this is my brain, by the way. It just happens to sit on my waist. All my phone numbers, I mean, I, I sometimes wouldn't remember my uh, my my daughter's cell phone number if I didn't have it right here. So um, so it just means you have to sort of rely on other technologies, and it may take a few more times to learn. So just switching gears, here's the good news though. This is T. Uh, this is MS. Now interestingly, you see all these lesions in the brain of MS. People with TM don't have those lesions. 
However, what's interesting is now we know that they have nothing to do uh, uh, with the cognitive impairment. And if you actually look at these lesions and try to correlate them with cognitive impairment in MS, they don't correlate or very, very poorly correlate. And the reason why that is is because even people with TM who don't have lesions still have the brain involved, still get depression, still get cognitive impairment. Um, and so we know it's not these. So the question is, what can you do if you can't rely on these lesions? And the answer is you can actually look at the chemistry of the brain. So this shows these peaks were obtained from an MRI scanner that was tuned not to water, which is what this is showing you. This is showing you water. Instead, it was tuned to look at chemicals in the brain. And I'm just going to show you, this is the hippocampus where we specifically, this is involved in learning and memory. This is affected in patients with Alzheimer's disease, for instance. And we looked at this little peak here, which was very predictive. How people did on the, the, their paper and pencil testing could be predicted correlation coefficients of, say, 0.9, where one is a perfect correlation, how their levels of this particular neuropeptide in the brain called NAG, N-acetylaspartoglutamate, there's not going to be a quiz on this later, uh, was highly predictive about how people would do. So the interesting thing is there is a drug that can increase the level of NAG in the brain. Um, it's not available for human use. So instead, Kristen Ron went to the animal model um, of MS. But by the way, the animal model of MS is really the same as the animal model of TM in that most of the lesions occur in the spine. It's called EAE or experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Almost all of the lesions are happening in the spine, and yet they still have cognitive impairment, these mice. And you can see those animals that got placebo were running all over and couldn't find their way to this hole on day one. Um, same thing in those on day one who got this drug, 2PMPA. However, by day four, those animals that were on placebo were still running all over the place a little bit. And those animals that got um, the drug went right forward pretty much. So you can see the path efficiency went from 0.3, where 1.0 is perfect path efficiency, 0.3 to 0.75. That's over a 200% increase. And I know it looks sort of funny this way, so let me show it to you this way, which is to say, right here, it's this forgetting from one day to the next that is what the problem is. So they go through four practice runs, then the next day you come in, and those animals that were getting placebo forgot. Those animals in blue here who got the drug didn't forget. And black shows you the animals that didn't have EAE. These were healthy mice without any autoimmune problems. And you can see that it gets all the way back up. This drug got the animals with EAE, the animal form of MS, got them all the... Oh, wow. So here we are. I have three minutes. Um, so I'm looking at that clock. That's when I started. So, um, so you can see it got them all the way back up to how they were. And now the exciting thing is that not just what we learn in TM uh, affects all of medicine, now we're looking at Alzheimer's disease, because in Alzheimer's disease there's the same thing, low levels of this protein in the brain. Really quick, Healing Waters, this is work done with Daniel Becker, uh, based on this really totally insane idea that Cody Unser had, that maybe um, scuba had an effect on people. Rehabilitation, when she went scuba diving, she noticed these zingers, you can ask her, she's in the back of the room, you can corner her later, and ask her why she came up with this crazy idea. And what you can see here is that um, Daniel and I uh, went with Cody and Daniel did the neurological exams and showed that all of the paralyzed war veterans who'd been paralyzed for an average of 15 years had decreased spasticity after doing 10 scuba dives. All of the patients had some level of increase in sensation, up to 20% increase that they hadn't had in 15 years, and half of them got some motor function back. That's unbelievable. That was not expected. And you can ask Daniel how surprised he was because he started paging me off the hook. Adam, 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 there's something. You know, when we got back, he looked at the data and started calling me up. So just real quick, just to let you know, we now know that there's this particular uh, effect of the nitrogen that happens when you scuba dive. It leads to a dramatic increase in serotonin. Turns out the all of walking, and Daniel, you can ask about this, all of walking, the reason why chickens with their head cut off still walk, because walking is really programmed into your spine, the central pattern generator. That's why you can walk and chew gum and you don't think about it. And it turns out that, um, that what we believe is going on is that the scuba uh, leads to nitrogen accumulation in the tissues and in the brain, leads to a significant increase in serotonin. That activates the central pattern generator, and that's what begins to reactivate the spine. And 
it's very exciting. And all, the reason why we haven't followed this up is that we're just waiting to get more funds to be able to go out there. We'd love to do this with patients with TM. This would be very exciting. This is what happens when you take an epidural stimulator and you do it three times a week for seven months. Remember, this was one week and we saw these effects. If you do a stimulator where you just lead to stimulation and general release of neurotransmitters from electricity, they took someone who was completely paralyzed by a motor vehicle accident and he was able to stand up and start to bear weight and even walk after seven months with the stimulator. And we think that you could do that if you could go scuba diving three times a week for seven months, or maybe if it's the serotonin that's key, the next thing is to actually test that out. So it's a very exciting time because um, first of all, I'm done. Uh, that's exciting. And the second reason is it's exciting time because now we have evidence that there are other ways of reactivating what exists in people's spines, not acutely, 15 years after injury. There are ways of reactivating the um, pathways that exist. This has to be repeated, obviously. Anything you do in science has to be repeated to make sure that it's not a fluke and um, all of those things. But um, it's very exciting because it suggests the idea that what exists right now in people's spine, even before you get stem cells or anything else from outside, may be able to activate the existing circuitry. I, I don't think, and I don't think Daniel thinks, that this is the answer in and of itself. But if you combine this with exercise and eventually stem cells and other treatments that come online, I think it's a very exciting time. I think the idea that we're going to reactivate the spinal cord is just down the road. So take home messages are the brain is involved in TM, depression happens, it's treatable. You know, if you worry about it in yourself or your loved one, just have them seen by a mental health professional, have them screened to see if that's what's going on. Um, second, second thing is that cognitive impairment does look like it happens. Uh, so if you have kids where we have the data, they just need a little more time. So, and we're happy to write and say, you know, your kid needs a little more time on their standardized tests, et cetera. We now have data to support that. Uh, also out of UT Southwestern, they also found some of these findings as well and published them. And, uh, and the last thing is the scuba diving. Um, if you, uh, if you, Stay tuned, uh, and there's actually uh, something in your packet about what we did. So now Maureen's being very good because she just wants to grab me and throw me off. But I'm only two minutes late, so thanks very much for your time.